The Digimon franchise is one of those long-running classics that conjures up fond memories whenever you bring it up. Whether you watched the numerous anime series or movies or played the games or even collected cards, this alleged Pokemon clone has a lot of nostalgia associated with it. And yes, it's 2024 and some people still think it's a knockoff of Pocket Monsters. Gonna be real here, I don't see how that works outside of the fact that there are monsters, you train them, and that's it. Well... As of this Sunday, the very first Digimon World game on the PlayStation is now over 25 years old, which by extension makes me feel old. It really got me thinking about the changes the franchise went through as time went on. It took a while for Digimon to settle on a particular genre of game. Back in the 90s, you almost never got the same genre of game twice, though in the late 2000s, the game settled on the JRPG genre for the most part. Well, aside from Digimon Survive being 70% visual novel, whatever that means. So, the long and short of it is, I want to go back and re-experience the classics yet again. I have fond memories of the PlayStation Digimon games, but I'm more than aware that nostalgia can often be misplaced. Be that as it may, there's no better place to start the journey than the original Digimon world on the PlayStation. Now, this game is the dictionary definition of Golden Age. Curiously, it actually wasn't the first Digimon game ever. The actual first game was more or less a direct adaptation of the V-Pets onto the Sega Saturn, but it has none of the charm the PlayStation game does. This game had more of an impact on the franchise than you might imagine. For example, did you know that Digimon World predated the anime, or that the original arc of the first anime series took place in the same setting as the game? This game's main character is even featured in the art for some of the card game's manuals, and it's very common for any Digimon show or game to reference back to this in some way. Most of the actual Digimon from the show are here in this game too. Well, except Gomamon, who for some reason is still on the box art for the PAL version, Anyways, you can see that this one game was actually pretty significant for Japan. Here in America, the anime is of similar significance since we got that first. The story starts out simple enough. An ordinary boy who happens to own a Digivice, which is the toy that the virtual pets were stored on, gets transported to the digital world to save it from an as-of-yet unknown threat. A common enough starting point for this kind of adventure, and the plot is on the whole simplistic. What makes the game memorable is its sense of adventure. You're given a Digimon partner and asked to explore a large island full of weird settings and wacky monsters, and something surprising or dangerous is behind every corner. You're actually given quite a lot of freedom as you explore. Your goal is to get Digimon to move to the city to increase its prosperity, measured by a score that goes up with every recruited Digimon. Sometimes you'll have to fight Digimon to recruit them, others want certain items or a task completed, some Digimon get entire quest lines dedicated to them, and you can take on all these tasks in any order you want. You only need a prosperity rating of 50 to complete the game, which is half the maximum, but very few Digimon are absolute requirements. There's no direct path to your goal, you can effectively go left or right from the start and be able to explore in either direction, with more areas opening up in between as you explore more of the world as you desire. And what a world it is! This game sports beautiful graphics for the time. It's peak PlayStation 1, with impressive pre-rendered backgrounds set to a memorable soundtrack that includes a lot of ambiance. The environments really come to life, with the classic bizarre environments that defined the digital world back then, with random toilets and vending machines everywhere, and apparently the trees plug into the ground and there's a canyon with an invisible bridge leading to a random shop in the middle of nowhere. Other neat places include a haunted mansion inhabited by a much friendlier vampire than you'd expect, a city built out of children's toys ruled by a teddy bear, a mountain of garbage where filth Digimon live next to a waste-producing factory, and a dinosaur-themed zone where time is slower, except for the desolate boneyard where time is accelerated. And you know what? I can keep going with this. The recovery items in this world are actually computer chips and floppy disks. Now doesn't that make you feel old? And so instead of treasure chests, the items are found inside computer monitors. Don't ask how food items are stored in computer monitors, however. Then you have some of the building designs. The house you start the game in looks like it was built out of cardboard boxes and a soup can as if they were made out of whatever they had at a garbage dump. When you start getting actual buildings in the city, they look amazing too. The restaurant, for example, is shaped like a giant oven with a stove on top. Fantasy worlds just don't do this kind of building design anymore. 
The game's atmosphere is compounded by incredible sound design. A lot of areas use environmental sounds to really make the areas come to life. And the music? The music hits you hard in the feels. One of my most well-remembered moments is ascending the mountain area and stepping into the Gear Savannah. The beautiful plains combined with the music is one of the game's most breathtaking moments. Then night falls and an even more epic track starts up. Really, the whole soundtrack is excellent. Of course, you're going to need some protection in the crazier areas of the island. That's where your own Digimon partner comes into play. You're in charge of not only his training, but also his health care. You're going to be the one feeding and training him, very reminiscent of Monster Rancher, which I'm sure was influenced by the original Digimon toys, which were themselves a spin-off of Tamagotchi. Digimon actually began life as a virtual pet aimed specifically at young male children. So, how do you turn a virtual pet for female children into something a boy would enjoy? Yeah, you have to guide your giant dinosaur to the toilet before he craps himself. This is just one of the many charming aspects of Digimon World. The game wears its toilet humor like a big brown t-shirt. Or should I say, T-SHIT! <laughs> okay, seriously, the poop hadn't even been colored pink back then. And if you failed to take care of your Digimon and let him crap himself too much, you'd find yourself the owner of a pet living pile of sludge or even quite literal living piles of feces. Yeah, that's uh, that's one way to motivate the player, I gotta say. <laughs> so uh, let's move on to the gameplay loop. The most important part of raising a Digimon is training. You do not level up, as it were. Battles give a very small amount of stats compared to the training stations found at the start of the game. Which stats you choose to train have an impact on what kind of Digimon you get when it's time for an evolution, which will eventually happen. But if you don't train enough or make too many mistakes taking care of your Digimon, you may be disappointed at what you get. Heck, even if you do train, it can be frustrating. This game does not tell you a whole lot about how evolutions work. Stats aren't the only thing controlling what a Digimon evolves into. How much they eat and the number of care mistakes made also affect their evolution. In fact, the game isn't even totally clear on what constitutes a care mistake. It was actually a long time before players started to get a firm grasp on all this stuff. There's also hidden bonus conditions such as winning enough battles or learning new moves. You're never told any of the conditions at all. In fact, there are many mechanics the game flat out does not tell you. For example, I had no idea elemental rock, paper, scissors was even a thing in this game until I read about it. Even something as simple as learning new moves can be a pain. The way you learn them is, if your current Digimon is capable of using a move, you can learn it by seeing it used by an opponent, but it's based entirely on luck whether you get it or not. The chances are different based on the Digimon learning it, and a particularly frustrating aspect of this is that some moves on some Digimon have a 0% chance of being learned even if it looks like you could. The other way to learn a move is if you're training the brain stat, you can randomly learn a new move at certain stat thresholds. They have to do that or you'd be able to permanently miss some moves that are only used by bosses. I'll admit this game can seem frustrating with how little it tells you directly, but I do actually recommend against looking up guides when you're starting out. It's very exciting and rewarding to find your partner has just evolved into an incredibly strong Digimon, and it really feels like a result of your own efforts. Spoiling yourself on how the game actually works can kill some of the magic, even though I do recommend eventually checking out a guide, because some of the best Digimon did not have their requirements discovered for a very long time. Some Digimon in this game were not present in the original V-Pets. These guys were thought to be mere urban legend in the game for a very long time. Your statistics consist of the standard HP, MP, attack, defense, speed, and brains. This game uses a combat system where your Digimon moves and attacks on his own in real time. HP, MP, attack, and defense are self-explanatory in function, and speed is how fast your Digimon uses moves. Brains is where some frustration comes from. The amount of input you have in giving orders depends on the Digimon's brain stat, as the higher this is, the more complex your orders can be. You unlock the last command at 500 brains, but raising it further will start reducing MP costs of moves. The game never seems to inform you of that. Your only other input in battle is activating your finisher, basically a limit break featuring the signature moves of the Digimon, and you can also use items. 
This battle system can seem very archaic, as players tend to prefer having an active influence on the combat rather than simply watching the action unfold. However, I think this system works better if you think of the player as a trainer or coach, issuing commands to an intelligent creature that acts on its own rather than being directly controlled by the player. You can still support your Digimon with items, but the most influence you have on the battle lies in the preparation. It can, however, feel as though the best strategy is to spam recovery items. Since you win rather easily if you have the money to be carrying around 99 max recovery items, there's an infinite money glitch and I do not recommend abusing it. It'll be much more fun to try and win battles economically. Of course, you could also save on resources by avoiding battles when possible. Battles are not random in the original Digimon world. Instead, enemies will engage in combat if you bump into them and they often have something silly to say before the fight starts. But be very careful, because if there are multiple enemies on screen when you engage in combat, then they will all gang up on you at once, and that can be very difficult to deal with. You only ever have one Digimon at a time. Most boss battles occur during story events, so it's easy to know when you're about to face one of them. However, there are some bosses that actually ambush players and take them by surprise. Those are the most frustrating to deal with, because you don't see them coming. At any rate, simple as the combat may seem, there is at least something like depth if you really pay attention to the little details, like the speed of certain move animations and how fast your Digimon is when attacking. Some Digimon have longer wind-up animations for similar moves, and naturally the bigger the Digimon, the bigger the hitbox or the greater the distance they need to initiate attacks. Further, a low damage move on a fast Digimon can constantly interrupt an opponent's attack if they're lucky. It isn't a huge amount of depth, but I thought it was worth mentioning. Oh, and status effects are a mechanic as well. In addition to the standard poison, confusion, and freeze effects, you have the most amusing and clever idea for a status effect I've ever seen, the flat status, which causes your Digimon to turn into a cardboard cutout of its 2D sprite from the old V-Pets. I told you the little details were the best in this game. Something that I think will turn off players more so than anything else I've described is the fact that your Digimon does in fact age and even die. This can happen if you lose too many battles or get sick, but it also just happens after a long enough period of time. Your Digimon will be reborn into a new Digimon with all learned attacks and a portion of stats retained, but this still means you have to redo the stat training and raise your Digimon from scratch again. The good news is, this means you're not stuck with the same partner all the time, but I know some players don't like it when they feel like their work was for nothing. However, any shops or features unlocked through story progress will still be there. The next life is always a little easier than the last. You can also record your Digimon stats for use in a multiplayer match. Not that anyone did that, but it feels good to record them like a nostalgic photograph. Still, having to train a new Digimon all over again means you're spending a lot of time in the gym area until you finally get back to where you were before. Standing at the training station clicking over and over isn't exactly fun when it's the only real way to pass time. Fighting doesn't give nearly the amount of stats training does, so you'd only want to fight bosses or enemies with a new attack you want to get, if you can, and I suppose getting a little extra money or item drops here and there might be worth the time. The whole system asks you to manage your time with your Digimon, choosing how long to train and setting out only when you're ready to take on whatever the next challenge may be. And again, if you know what challenge you're going to take on next, you can better prepare your Digimon for that challenge. Of course, that challenge might not necessarily be a battle, because the game also features a number of minigames. Some are fun. I like the curling minigame as long as I'm not going for a perfect score, and the obligatory fishing minigame functions well enough. It's at least more fun than the ones from the Zelda games. Minigames can be fun or frustrating depending on the player, but what's universally reviled is the shopping minigame, where you manage a general store and try to extort money out of paying customers. It is completely random, whether they pay enough money for you to hit the quota you're going for, and it's made many players angry. This is one situation where I fully endorse RNG manipulation. Other side content includes a selection of achievements for stuff like recruiting all Digimon, getting all evolutions at least once, learning all the moves, and collecting every Digimon card. The cards do nothing on their own, but allow you to trade for some rare items, so it's nice to check out the Secret Shop, which sells rare cards on occasion. There are also battle tournaments held at various times in a couple of locations. None are required for story progress, but they're actually quite detailed. See, every time you recruit a Digimon or defeat an enemy, even the random encounters, they become a potential tournament opponent and you can unlock themed tournaments when enough opponents are available for that tournament. 
There's even a secret boss that appears only in tournaments after meeting him as an NPC. I also have to give some attention to the high number of glitches, which I guess is appropriate for a digital world, and it is funny that a high glitch count is a quality this game shares with the first generation of Pokémon. Similarly to that game, most of the bugs aren't something you'll run into through normal play, although I have had the game lock up or enter infinite loops upon touching particular enemies. Some glitches can even be taken advantage of, and there's an entire YouTube channel dedicated to documenting such tricks. If at this point you're thinking I'm saying the game is bad, I'm really not. The battle system, the island exploration, and really the whole game in general, while frustrating and cryptic, can be a lot of fun once you start putting in some effort to learn more about it. And once you do, each new discovery is another fun, memorable moment. Cryptic aspects of games like this also tend to create communities of players feeling out how the game works, and sharing that info online, for example. The reason I say not to use one of their guides at first, however, is that experiences such as getting an ultimate level Digimon for the first time feels all the more rewarding when you didn't know what the requirements were. As if the game were saying, you're much better at the game now than you were at the start, let me reward you for it. Being responsible for feeding and potty training your Digimon also does wonders for creating a bond between the player and their digital monster. It took a couple more games for Pokémon to achieve something like that. Digimon just happens to be a very different kind of game. The localization is another matter, however. The English script is riddled with spelling and grammar issues. It's almost charming at times, as if a five-year-old wrote it, but there are text boxes you have to read once or twice in order to comprehend what's being said, and when the game is actually trying to give you a clue to a puzzle or some hint towards how the system works, let's just say the text is not comprehensible to all readers. The localization is even prone to adding more glitches. Infamously, the unlockable jukebox that plays any music you've already heard crashes the PlayStation in the North American release due to a very easily fixed text overflow error. I'm not even going to get into all the problems the European versions of the game had. Oh my goodness, Europe, I am so sorry. At the end of the day, though, the original Digimon World stands out as one of the most unique games of its day, one of the most influential pieces of the Digimon franchise, and a nostalgic part of my childhood, as is the case for many of its players. It may shock you to learn, then, that only two other games in the Digimon franchise follow in its footsteps. These are re-digitized for the PSP, later ported to the 3DS, and Next Order, which just got a Switch port. Only Next Order has been released internationally, and as much as I did enjoy it, the magic of the original may be impossible to replicate. Maybe that's why there are so many Digimon JRPGs. It's just kind of a shame they had such a unique creation and took so long to follow up on it. The original is still there for new players to go back and enjoy, though. It's an amazing adventure worth experiencing at least once. As for future Digimon titles, well, things wouldn't be all sunshine and daisies for the Digimon games after that. But we'll save that story for another time. Thank you for watching my retrospective of the original Digimon World. If you'd like to try this game for yourself but would like a more player-friendly experience, I've recently become aware of a very promising mod for the game that you can download on romhacking.net. It offers lots of quality of life changes, lots of bug fixes, and even balance changes. So if you're interested, check the video description for the download link. See you later, everyone.